Welcome to our last webinar in our nine part series of the End of Life Symposium. Today's focus is on aid in dying medications and the clinical competencies of prescribing. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you a very inspiring and talented physician. She serves as the chair and course director of the End of Life Symposium, Dr. Chandana Banerjee. Thank you, Crystal, and welcome everybody. It truly gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this last webinar series. Um, as you know, the webinar series has been hugely successful, divided in three domains, humanities at the end of life, clinical aspects at the end of life, and medical aid in dying, which is one of the domains we will cover today. But before we go on to the program, I would really sincerely like to thank so many of you from the bottom of my heart for making this webinar series hugely successful. A huge thank you to our steering committee for the end of life planning steering members, the City of Hope AV staff, the City of Hope continuing medical education team, Compassionate Choices and, all, and, and the collaborators that we had through them, our wonderful panelists and speakers over the nine series that we've had, and above all, all of you are attending uh, attendees, because without you, the series would not have been a huge success. Also, it gives me great pleasure to announce that after this, we will be going live and the next End of Life Symposium 2021 will be held in Las Vegas from December 16th through the 18th of this year. And we hope to see many of you there. Thank you. So moving on to today's presentations, I would like to introduce Matt Whitaker. And in his role as National Director of Integrated Programs at Compassion and Choices, Matt Whitaker works to support medical education, end of life planning, and client services nationwide. Over the course of his six years at Compassion and Choices, he has taken on various roles, including time as the State Director for California and Oregon, as they launch campaigns to increase access to end of life choice. Matt holds a master's in theological studies which em with emphasis in integrative theology, a specialty certificate in hospice and palliative care chaplaincy, and he is a board certified music therapist. Matt will be moderating today's discussions. Thank you. Welcome, Matt. Wonderful, thank you for the welcome, Dr. Banerjee. And uh, I wanna begin by mirroring the comments that were shared, the, the sense of gratitude um, that I think all of us feel uh, today at this ninth end of life uh, education piece and webinar and final one in the series. And I wanna reflect with gratitude for uh, Dr. Banerjee's uh, leadership in this and for the recognition of all of those who've been a part of this that in the past year, we've had uh, a host of various needs uh, there, there's been a need for practical skills uh, that people need to, to learn. Uh, but also there's been a need for the arts, for moments where we get together and we, we talk about poetry and literature and film uh, as they address this, this topic. Um, but most of all, I think we've all had the need for community and for us to be together as a community for these nine webinars, it's given me um, a great sense of satisfaction and comfort to know that they're there. And, uh, and indeed gives me a great deal of excitement and comfort knowing that in the future, many of us who have gotten together in this virtual sense will be together in person for a symposium and we can laugh and uh, maybe even hug by then, who knows? And, and it will be a, a great day. But you know, something that I uh, recognize as we've gone through this process is that sometimes we don't recognize the community that we're a part of in these virtual sessions. And uh, I wonder if we could just do something together to recognize that there are currently over 500 people who are all uh, coming together with a, a similar intention of learning, learning how to care better for people, learning uh, how it is that we do that, how it is that we be compassionate and empathetic to one another in a, in a oftentimes difficult situation. And in acknowledgement of that community, I wonder if you'd just join me in just taking a deep breath all together. Just in through our nose, out through our mouth. All of us, 500 plus across the country, together in community, uh, 
what a beautiful thing that has happened over those sources, these nine different offerings and is happening today. So thank you all for being here. Uh, I'll be moderating today, which means I get to introduce our fantastic speakers. And also I'll be back when it's time for questions and answers to take place. And we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. But now it's really my pleasure and, and a great honor to get to uh, introduce our two speakers for today. The first being Dr. David Grube, uh, who I'll get into his background just more in a second. The other Dr. Susan Guess. Um, Dr. Grube uh, comes to us after a long career as a family physician and as a person who's been deeply involved in all things end of life care uh, from early on in the hospice movement in the United States. Um, not only uh, is he present in, in the hospice world, but also supported a number of patients through uh, the process of medical aid and dying in Oregon in the course of his active career. And since 2014, we've been lucky at Compassion and Choices to have him in the role of National Medical Director, where he provides education like that which we're doing today, but also provides one-on-one -on -one, uh, support, both educationally uh, and emotionally, to people who are going through this process uh, in states where uh, aid and dying is authorized, supporting physicians, social workers, nurses, hospice staff, pharmacists. Um, so we are so lucky to have Dr. Grube and to have him bring his background today. We are also very lucky to have uh, Dr. Susan Guess, a PharmD, who will be uh, helping walk us through some of the pharmacology and talking about her specific program that she works in. And Dr. Guess comes to us with over 30 years of practice in clinical pharmacy with training from UCSF, both for pharmacy school as well as residency uh, trainings. Um, and since 2016, she's been responsible as a consulting pharmacist with Kaiser around the End of Life Option Act, uh, counseling patients and their families uh, about this process and going above and beyond and providing real emotional support and guidance for them as well and representing a real steady hand in that process. So I know uh, I've learned a lot listening to Dr. Guest. I know that you'll learn a lot today as well. Uh, just to address up front for the sake of CME purposes, none of us who are speaking today on the call have any disclosures to make. And with that, I'm going to hush until the uh, Q&A portion. I'll be monitoring your questions in those boxes and turn it over to Dr. Grube. Thank you very much, Matt. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Banerjee, for uh, allowing me to, to participate uh, uh, in this webinar today. Uh, I've been looking forward to this and I've really enjoyed the previous webinars that the City of Hope um, has presented. So this is a pharmacy uh, presentation and I was trying to think of a pharmacy cartoon I could share and this is the one that came to mind. It's almost a COVID cartoon. I do know many people uh, who've gotten a new pet to help with their mood during the last 14 months. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there are many end of life options that we've heard about over the last uh, uh, seminars. Uh, and the one we're going to be focusing on today is medical aid in dying. Now, I know that um, there's a mixed audience, and many of you are have gone to the, all of the webinars, and some of you have gone to some of them. And But I kind of want to get back to basics in the first few slides uh, so that I make sure that we're sort of all on the same page. Medical aid in dying. This is a situation where a terminally ill individual, that means someone who is six months or less to live, a hospice type patient, requests from her or his physician for a prescription which they can self-ingest uh, to end their life, but more importantly, to end their intolerable terminal suffering. So the, that is really the, the issue here is the intolerable uh, terminal suffering uh, that these individuals have. They must, uh, uh, next slide, thank you, Matt. Uh, they must be a resident and they must be an adult and they must have capacity. Uh, they must understand uh, what they are um, doing. And as I mentioned, they must self ingest. Now there was a slide there, uh, which we might go back to, to show that now one in five adults who live uh, in the US um, reside in a jurisdiction in one of the uh, 10 states and the District of Columbia where medical aid in dying is a legal, legal and authorized option. New Mexico was just added, uh, added to this list and there are quite a number of other states 
So it's a very important topic to understand and particularly to become educated about as we are going to be today. Thank you, Matt. And then also to remind ourselves, how do we respond? Uh, wh whatever our role on the medical team, whether we're the physician, the pharmacist, a nurse, a social worker, chaplain, et cetera, the beginning is situations like today, learning what aid and dying is and what it is not, um, and exploring our personal beliefs and how um, we might respond to a request when it occurs. It's very important to have a full conversation with a dying person about their options and very important to listen and put into context what their wishes and values are uh, so that we can respond and, to them and, and help assuage their fears. This conversation in and of itself is so palliative that many individuals who consider aid in dying might change their mind um, after they uh, understand fully uh, what they are able to do or not do. So we do need to explore um, their, the, the question uh, more than once, and, but most importantly, we need to listen and discuss this with uh, uh, their family and loved ones. Then finally, the, a very important part of this is our professional integrity, um, not to get our personal beliefs uh, in the way of putting the patient first. Um, and if we are unable to support a request from a patient, we should refer that individual, the dying person, to another healthcare provider to discuss end of life options. Next slide. Now I'll remind you about the provider components. Um, there are um, two physicians who must be involved. The prescribing physician, also called the attending physician. She is the doctor who evaluates the patient, is care, has the primary responsibility for their care, um, documents on the medical record the requests, uh, and, fo and follows uh, the standards of care, which are outlined uh, in, in many other publications at this time. And then ultimately prescribe the medications that we're going to be talking about in a minute. The consulting physician uh, is a second physician who um, also evaluates the patient, confirms the eligibility requirements, notifies the attending physician, uh, and has, in most jurisdictions, forms to complete. Um, so these are the two physicians. Uh, in Hawaii, uh, a mental health provider must be um, a part of the evaluation, but in other states, a mental health provider is necessary only when there's a question of capacity or volition uh, in, these, in these kinds of cases. And as we're going to be talking specifically today, other very important uh, in parts of the medical team involved in these cases are the pharmacist, the nurse, the social worker, and the chaplain. As you can see, the healthcare team essentially uh, for hospice. In my personal opinion, all of these individuals should be enrolled in hospice. And in most jurisdictions, uh, and in Oregon where I live, almost all of them are. Next slide, thank you. And a few important reminders. Language does matter. And the language that we, we use in healthcare, not just end of life care, but in all healthcare, should be non-judgmental and kind. Um, medical aid in dying is the appropriate language. And to remind ourselves not to use the language, uh, to use the word suicide, um, in any form uh, during this process. It, this is clearly uh, an alternative uh, to, to that tragic situation. A reminder that the death certificate sh should have be completed for with the uh, terminal illness on it, whether it was in an in instance lung cancer or ALS, um, we put those on and we don't put medical aid in dying uh, on the death certificate. To remind ourselves that a request for this from a patient is not a failure of hospice or palliative care, it's a component and integrated into a full uh, palette of options at end of life in those jurisdictions that I mentioned. And that mental health evaluations are rarely necessary. Almost never do these individuals need to have a referral for mental health 
uh, evaluations. They know what they want. They've known this for a long time. Next slide, please. So now we're going to be discussing medications. Um, and the medications, of course, uh, are uh, individualized as is possible in each case. It's uh, like in family medicine, every time I saw a patient, it seemed like it was a totally new situation to me, um, even though we had many, many different options. And th this is no different either. Each of these cases needs to be looked at individually. Uh, next slide, please. I wanna give a, just a brief little history. Um, as Matt mentioned, uh, I practiced uh, for many, many years. And when aid and dying became law in Oregon in 1997, um, we used, uh, and in the years that I practiced, we used rapid acting uh, barbiturates, cecobarbital or pentobarbital. However, pentobarbital was no longer available in the US. And uh, shortly after that, the price of cecobarbital skyrocketed for uh, no understandable reason and then became unavailable as well. And so after that, uh, and actually even before, when individuals were unable to afford the three or $4,000 uh, for a small dose of uh, cecobarbital, um, new options began to be developed and a, a collaborative effort from physicians in a number of different states, and I should also say, and pharmacists, um, came up with different protocols and each of them had different sort of kind of names and then abbreviations. Um, a popular, I should not say popular, but a um, one that was used commonly was DDMP and then uh, the components were changed and it was called then DDMP2 and subsequently a DDMA or D-DMA. And then when phenobarbital was added, um, the, uh, there were different um, abbreviations as you can see, some doctors now are prescribing half the dose of digoxin to cut the price in half. Um, so there are a number of things, but there has been an evolution and there will continue to be an evolution. And that's why it's important to stay up to date and consult with uh, uh, mentors and with uh, groups such as Compassion and Choices uh, if you'd like to have more information. Next slide, please. Um, DDMA is digoxin, 100 milligrams, diazepine a gram, morphine sulfate, 15 grams, and amitriptyline, eight grams. D uh, slash DMA is th the same as above, but the digoxin powder is given as 30 minutes before. And then phenobarbital, uh, five grams, has recently uh, been considered uh, as an addition to these and is used in some locations. Next slide, please. So. Um, an individual can take their regular medications. Um, they should have an empty stomach and they should not have been ingesting um, high fat uh, foods. Um, and that they begin one hour prior to the ingestions of other medications, uh, taking uh, pre-medications uh, to improve absorption and prevent vomiting. In the D, uh, DMA uh, protocol, um, the uh, uh, digoxin uh, is given um, and I'm sorry, this slide, there's an error on this slide, but the digoxin powder, um, 100 milligrams is given one half hour later. And the, at the ingestion, then the diazepam, morphine sulfate, and amitriptyline are taken together. Um, Dr. Guess is gonna speak about this um, in a minute. Next slide, please. Um, Dr. Shavelson and um, others uh, have recently recommended um, the uh, addition of phenobarbital uh, and this uh, references uh, in your uh, resource material and at, at the end of the presentation. There are a few red flags, uh, particularly with uh, in regard to gastrointestinal um, disease. Um, these are listed here um, and should be a, a warning to re-examine whether um, the uh, route of administration or the administration itself um, might be changed or considered differently. Next slide, please. There are a number of barriers. Um, this is a complex process as you've already understood today. Um, now the uh, medications are only available in a compounding pharmacy, no longer in a retail or traditional type pharmacy. Um, sometimes cost can be a barrier, particularly since Medicare will not pay for these medications. Some pharmacies are owned by faith-based organizations which will not uh, fill the medications. And I've had occasion uh, when uh, the pharmacist 
uh, herself would not fill the medication. As uh, noted in this article in the Journal of uh, Geriatrics by uh, a geriatrician in South Carolina, Dr. Hazard, whose sister uh, used um, medical aid in dying in Oregon uh, in his presence. And then, of course, the waiting periods, uh, which uh, I think Dr. Guest will also be speaking to briefly. Um, insurances, as I mentioned, uh, federal insurances do not pay. In California and Oregon, um, Medicaid insurances do pay for the medicine, and many uh, regular insurance companies do pay for the medication. Next slide. Uh, so that's my overview, but I really want to spend uh, our attention now to uh, Dr. Guess, who's going to take us through the pharmacology uh, of these uh, medical aid and dying medications. Thank you. Susan? Thank you, Dr. Groob and Matt for letting me know I was on uh, mute. Um, I am a pharmacist and want to discuss the pharmacist role in medical aid in dying, but I do have to give you a little context that I am in a special situation where I'm in an integrated system of Kaiser Permanente. And when the medical aid in dying law went into effect in California in 2016, there was an, a concerted effort to make a broad program that involved all the specialists that would be involved in the program. So we have physician leads at each medical center, program coordinators who cover the areas and um, patient coordinators as well who work with the patients. And then the pharmacist is brought in towards the end of the process. So this is a little bit different than a pharmacist who's independent from an integrated system who might be contacted by a physician or receive the prescription and then need to consult the patient. However, many of the things that we'll be talking about will apply to them as well. Um, one thing I do want to point out that uh, piggybacks on what Dr. Group said is that when this law went into effect, one of the things that we did was to do multiple grand rounds that are called Schwartz rounds, which are were established by Dr. Schwartz to support medical care professionals when with the emotional side of things that they deal with. So a lot of times we discuss the didactics, but we don't discuss the emotional support we need with difficult patient situations. And so this was definitely an aspect that we could discuss in that um, scenario. And there was a discussion about how people felt about this new law, the nervousness about participating, the barriers in participating, and just expressing feelings and, and uncertainty. And so that was a development over the years that the, we continue to have programs. So um, pharmacists could volunteer. Um, like Dr. Group said, if you don't feel comfortable doing this program, a pharmacist can refuse to dispense and it is um, perfectly optional to participate as a physician or as a pharmacist. And if a phar physician is not feeling comfortable to participate, then we refer them to a medical aid and dying physician. Pre-COVID, we had a situation where the patient coordinator would um, most of the time accompany a pharmacist out and we would have a team approach, which was really special to deliver the medications directly to the patient with a chain of custody type situation and then consult the patient in person. Um, yet just yesterday, I did my first in-person consultation in more than a year, and it was phenomenal. It was just really great to be there in person again. Um, during COVID, we've been doing a lot of video visits and telephone visits, um, but I tell you, there's nothing like in person to make all the medications you bring just very simplified down to what the process is. So next slide, Matt. All right. So Whatever scenario that a pharmacist faces, it's really important to have good supportive materials. Um, there's a great patient brochure that we've shared our work on with Compassionate Choices and other folks. Um, we'll show you that in a minute. The timeline is given not only in uh, words, but in a nice, easy to follow picture version, which I focus on when I bring out the medications it really calms people down that um, it's going to be very simple in the end. Um, there is information for the pharmacist so they understand the process and feel supported in uh, their consultation. And then we've also created a standardized note so that um, it's very easy to document what you need to document. 
So it's very important that a pharmacist have a good comfort level. Um, and this is not just going to happen by itself. I think it's very important for a pharmacist to shadow an experienced pharmacist. And, and of course, that would be with patient permission. Not all patients or families are comfortable with that. But if that can be done, that helps um, ease the pharmacist into knowing um, that this can be done and how it can be done. And again, the good supporting materials and feeling knowledgeable about the medications are important and there's a reference uh, added right there. Now, important to know is that you have to know yourself as a pharmacist or a physician, is this for you? Because it's not for everyone and there's no shame in it not being for you. But as you get more comfortable, you might find that it is for you. Next slide. Okay, so here's an example of that brochure I was talking about. The picture is really, um, and I'm sorry, it's a little bit blurry on my view, um, but you can see the just gist of it is that it's very simple. And we just talk about um, what we're gonna cover in the visit is to review the medications, the time sequence, what to expect, and how to safely store this medication that we wanna keep out of the hands of children and pets and then dispose of either if you use a, uh, the death uh, medications or if you have other medications you need to get rid of. And the average consultation is usually 20 to 30 minutes. Um, go ahead, Matt, I'll go on to the next one. Okay, so there's a lot of variations in the drug regimens that Dr. Groob talked about. Here's a typical pictorial of what a patient might see in their kit or in the bag that they get. And you can see on the right-hand side, um, there is going to be a glass bottle of powdered medication, whatever mixture the physician has ordered. The pre-medications um, are uh, shown there in little plastic bottles. And then we usually do an empty measuring bottle and other accoutrement like a wide bore straw to help people take the uh, liquid more easily. And so it can get to be a lot of items that the patient sees. Um, we talk about what the mixture is, that it's only good for six months because it's raw powder and that it's gonna have a bitter taste. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a gritty mixture because not everything gets completely dissolved. So it's very important to tell the patient all these factors so they won't start taking the medication, be shocked, express concern, and not be able to take the medication in the time allotted. Um, the pre-medications, again, are only three tablets. I always reassure people that these can be crushed if somebody's having a trouble swallowing them. Luckily, they're small tablets, so that's not often a problem. But the back of a spoon and a little Pyrex dish, easy home um, way to crush them and take it with a little bit of liquid or even applesauce, which is not a big meal that we worry about. Um, and then it's really critical that they have that uh, paper support for the consultation to follow along while you're speaking, as well as having it when you leave. And this is a very overwhelming time for a lot of people. So having both methods of verbal and written is important. Next slide. Okay, so in, especially in systems or in uh, a scenario where a pharmacist is on their own, it's really helpful to have the physician call the pharmacy involved to talk with the pharmacist directly, the consulting pharmacist directly. Let them know the way that they're going to prescribe it and make sure that any questions are answered up front. So it may be a question of, you know, are you concerned about the GI tract being in functional, uh, uh, format so that the drug's going to be uh, absorbed. Is the patient on high dose opioids where you might want to add phenobarb in there? Just so you're a, a consulting team and a coordinated team. Um, ingestion factors also to include are whether you have to anticipate a feeding tube and include the proper syringe that would fit um, a J tube or other ways that you would have to administer the drug and um, whether the pre-medications should be liquid versus the tablets that need to be crushed. So all those need to be discussed and anticipated. And then it's important that the physician and family know that you have to order this medication with plenty of days in advance because this is not common medication that is kept in a pharmacy um, unless they're an end of life pharmacy. Um, so you may make it, need to get those in stock. And also the factor of even with 
Um, this being a compounded medication, the cost still is quite prohibitive for some people at around, you know, $700. Better than the Cicabarb though, that was $2,000. Okay, so in our system, we've decided right now to use a specific kit and the three medications uh, containers we provide is an amber glass bottle with the DDMA, which is what we use here at Kaiser two tablets of metoclopramide and one tablet of haloperidol. We also give them um, the amber bottle as a measuring device, and we do mark at the three ounce mark so that it's not something that they look at the uh, measuring device and say, where am I supposed to pour to? And it's really easy to tell the patient then, here you go measure applesauce, or sorry, apple juice to the line. And I highly recommend they have a funnel handy so that a shaky hand isn't a factor in the, uh, in the pouring. Um, and then they can see that three ounces is not that much if it fits in this small bottle. Also, we encourage patients who are nervous about whether they can drink this mixture in the required time that they practice with just three ounces of regular apple juice. And we recommend apple juice because we have apple flavoring in our mixture already. Um, and then the kit will include a syringe if the patient has a G tube or a peg. And then we have patient consultation packets, a takeaway bag, which is a disposal pre-addressed envelope and a medication response card. So let me spend a moment on this. We've gotten good feedback from the family members on what has worked and what hasn't worked and what their experience has been and what they wish they had had. So we've adjusted our system from there. Go ahead, Matt. Um, okay, so the timeline, we've already discussed this. Uh, Dr. Group spent a little bit on this, but this is what we tell the patient. The importance of taking the medication within one to two minutes, very important. We tell them, have all your goodbyes said, be in a comfortable position, wear whatever favorite clothing you want to uh, wear. You can go outside if you want to sit outside, but be all prepared that in Drinking it in one to two minutes is important because people fall asleep within two minutes. So you have to be able to get the full dose into your system. And then you will eventually go into a coma where if somebody tried to shake you awake, they couldn't arouse you. And then the variability of when you will pass away and that many people pass away as quickly as eight minutes, um, but uh, the average is two hours. And then we always have to warn people that there may be a prolonged scenario because the family would be very uncomfortable if we didn't warn them of that. And we explain the cases where that might be a possibility, you know, high opioid doses, difference in weight, just to give them a feeling of that. Go ahead, Matt. Okay, so it's important that you, um, as a pharmacist, you give the why. Why are we doing it this way? And we talk about the DDMA mixture um, and why it's important to uh, ingest in one to two minutes. The pre-medication, why it's important, the metoclopramide, especially for getting the gut moving, um, keeping it, getting the medication down to where it needs to be absorbed. That it's important not to skip this step. Sometimes I, um, consult a patient who's like, can I take the medication now? I don't want the pre-medication. So it's very important. If you want this to work, you have to take the pre-medication. And then giving the details of why each of the ingredients has been used in this mixture and their function. And you can easily say, this is, these are all medications to slow down your breathing and your heart rate. And that's the direction that we want to go. Um, and then uh, the, with the addition of amitriptyline to the mixture, which was done to make the time of death more standardized, it brought along uh, a little bit more bitterness, bitterness and some burning. So the next slide we'll talk about amitriptyline burning. Um, it can be noticed as severe in about 10% patients. So we want to reassure them and the, tell them to have a spoonful of sorbet. Um, it's a very loving gesture to give somebody a spoonful of sorbet to rinse the bitter taste out of their mouth and soothe that burning so that it's a nice transition. Next. Other helpful tips for the family. I talked about this, the position of being slightly up right. So they avoid regurgitation, ensure there's no interruptions, the trial, um, reassuring that it's a peaceful passing um, that the patient will not feel any pain. It's amazing how many people ask that. And then disposing of unused medication because there's a lot of medications around the house and less, uh, luckily hospice helps with that as well. Um, so the varying experiences, not all pharmacists have to be 
you know, feel like they have to be very empathetic and, you know, have a certain style to do this. Very matter of fact is okay. Um, very emotionally supportive can be okay. And, and you have to know that you're going to walk into different scenarios. Um, some patients are very straightforward and have little emotion. Some are laughing and joyous that they have this option and will be uh, joking along. Um, a lot of times when I unpack the box or have people unpacking the box, I say, I know you can take a minute if you want. It's really hard when the medications come in in person and it makes it very real. And it's it, it's really helpful to just give them that permission. And then you kind of know which direction it's going. And if they get emotional, just to say it's okay, we'll take a moment. So um, just a little note at the bottom, you can be professional and have a tear in your eye. So um, it's okay if you're worried about that. Um, the rewards of doing this, um, I've done a lot of different work in my life as a pharmacist, and this is some of the most rewarding work I've ever done. Um, it provides people with a choice. And a lot of our patients say that I just want the medications in hand in case, and it gives them so much reassurance. 30% um, of the patients never end up using the medication. Um, and you, choosing death with dignity or uh, medical aid in dying is, um, Often the patients say they just want some autonomy. They just want some control in the end. And you're supporting both the patient and the family um, when you do this work. And I think that is it. Oh, oh, I did want to, um, sorry, Matt, this is going to take an extra second. Um, so medic, you're stuck in a position as a pharmacist and being the last person to see the patient a lot of times. And I did want to introduce this idea of a case of um, a wife confirmed um, that she was ready for consultation. When the pharmacist showed up, the patient was um, completely unarousable in a hospital bed. So the question is by law, if you're supposed to consult the patient and get their acknowledgement that they understand, can you leave the medications? So upon further questioning, it turned out that the patient was given lorazepam the night previous by hospice because they were in increased pain and that's why the patient could not be aroused. But the reason for the increased medication, uh, the lorazepam and giving an extra dose of fentanyl patch was because the patient was so disoriented with pain, he drew out a knife and cornered his wife in the bathroom doorway and threatened to kill her. So in that case, I definitely could not leave the end of life medication, both for not being able to consult and because there might be um, discretion about whether the wife had anything to do with this. So there are some interesting scenarios and you have to think on your feet and follow the law. So um, that was an interesting case to bring to you. So are there any questions? Wonderful, thank you both. Um, uh... I've already seen this presentation and I learned something new uh, on that <laughs> round through. So thank you so much. There are, are quite a few questions, some general, some uh, pretty uh, specific around certain pieces. And uh, one thing that came up was just in the uh, course of the discussion around compounding pharmacies. And that question was uh, for Dr. Rube, before we were at this juncture where the medication had to be compounded, did you find any kind of trend around whether small independent pharmacies versus large chains like CVS or Walgreens or Fred Meyer or whatever it might be um, on whether or not they dispense medication and protocols that they might've had in place? Um, not really. Um, I think uh, once a pharmacist uh, sort of understood what uh, medical aid and dying was all about, then uh, that pharmacist, uh, whether they be in a small uh, pharmacy or in a big chain, um, you know, reacted in the professional way that they should. Uh, the case that I did mention of the uh, woman who, um, the, the doctor's sister, um, she actually had ridden her uh, Moby, her little electric wheelchair, four miles to get the medicine herself in a big chain that, that had a policy of, of, of uh, providing medical aid in dying uh, medications. Um, but that individual pharmacist that day, the only one on duty, uh, refused. So it was a, a really sad case because this very ill and very, uh, a woman in a lot of pain had to ride her little wheelchair back four miles to give me a call. And then we were able the next day to get uh, her medication for her. So I wouldn't say that, uh, that, it's, that it's either the large chains or the small retail pharmacy. I think it's a mixed bag. But if the pharmacy is owned by, for example, the Catholic Church, 
uh, that would not be a pharmacy that would participate. Thank you, Dr. Grub. Uh, a question for you, uh, Dr. Guest. Uh, there have been a, quite a few questions around expiration of the medication, both of the medication and of a written prescription, all of those kinds of factors that come to bear. And some people just wanted to know, like, what is the protocol for addressing those various pieces? Do you dispose of the medication and redispense, or you know, does the written prescription expire? How do you handle those pieces? Um, Dr. Guru can talk a little bit about the written prescription because some places actually write the prescription and then do not dispense the medication until uh, the patient indicates that they want to use it. So that way they don't waste the medication and um, the patient is actually ready to ingest. So in that case, Dr. Grube, uh, is it a six month expiration like most controlled substances? Uh, it, it is um, indeed six months and then okay. the process has to be done again in, right. uh, in all the jurisdictions, uh, the, not just in Oregon. Okay, so, and in the similar way, we usually, we have to date dispense the medication when the patient has put in their uh, numerous requests. And because they get so much reassurance from having the medication available, and they're usually quite towards the end of their process, um, we do dispense it to the home. We haven't changed that process. Um, and then I have done repeat consultations on patients and re-delivered new kits to them. And we do tell them that at the time of consultation, the first time we say we are happy to re-dispense this and do a, a repeat consultation. And on the repeat consultations, it's very key to do it again, because by that time they've forgotten quite a bit and it's important to re-go over with everything again. You know, Matt, I'd like to add that it's so important to be, uh, as I mentioned, um, in have these individuals be enrolled in hospice because I can think of a case we had just recently of a woman who had the medication in her home and her um, family dynamics uh, with her husband and her son um, and her own personal um, behaviors changed um, and it became unsafe not only for the medicine to be in the home um, but even for hospice nurses to be in the home and so there are on occasions where um, I believe it's the appropriate thing to do to remove the medications even after they have been dispensed for safety uh, of family members, uh, et cetera. Wonderful. Um, so, so very specific questions for both of you. The first being around the addition of amitriptyline and what the rationale was behind that addition. I can do that or doctor. Okay. So uh, like I said, with uh, Kaiser Permanente, we have a nice integrated system. We tracked every um, case and we saw the variability that happened when we used DDMP2. And that was the, um, when Sigabarbital stopped being used, that's what we went to. Um, and we had a couple cases that were really quite large outliers. Um, I believe 32 hours was one of the longest ones. Um, and we had a couple that were, you know, good, in, well into the 24 hour mark. And that was just very difficult on the family. So for quite a long time, we looked at what the other uh, arrangements were out there from other medication mixtures and decided on DDMA because it had a much more standard time to death and less variability. Yes, I, I think that's right. Uh, it is uh, this uh, excellent collaboration between uh, physicians uh, uh, and experiences with pharmacists um, that allow us to, to make changes that are appropriate. Um, and uh, amitriptyline had been used in a prior protocol um, and that, that's why it replaced the, the uh, um, beta blocker. Yep, and there's an interesting review from the Washington group um, of physicians that looked at the addition of phenobarb and um, the time to death and how that's helped as well. But then there was a discussion about whether the time to death was too quick for the families because there needs to be some time to adjust as you see your family member passing. So it's an interesting, uh, I think we have it in the references as yes, well. I, I anecdotally now will, will add that the only time in the cases that I had while I was in practice where a family got really, I think, upset was when the, uh, their loved one died too quickly. Um, she fell asleep after a couple minutes and died within 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I had been counseling them as I thought was appropriate that 
this could take a while. It might be a few hours. I'll be there, I'll be, you know, on and on. And when the person just, uh, the, the book closed and the, and the story was over so rapidly, um, that was upsetting to the family. And yeah. I, I needed to change the way that I counseled after that. Yeah. That kind of segues nicely into another question that's come up, which is about, you know, what type of wraparound support is provided to a family um, to protect against that instance where there might be an extended process? What, what, what do you do for a family where that's occurring? What type of support comes from hospice, et cetera, in, in those instances uh, in, in both of your experience? Well, there's been a very significant change uh, in the hospice community um, particularly the non-religiously uh, affiliated hospices over the number of years uh, that I've, you know, 20, last 25 years. Um, and so many hospices, including the hospices that I'm associated with in Oregon, um, are supportive of patient's choice, which means that they can allow their nurse to be present. Um, they, they have a special um, uh, understanding of grief uh, and how to counsel the family um, after the death of the loved one. Um, and, uh, and then with more and more experiences, uh, it's becoming um, uh, in, you know, in many areas now uh, in, uh, in states where the, uh, this auth is authorized, um, where the support of hospice is, is so invaluable. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, it doesn't mean that the rest of us shouldn't, even if we're not in hospice, we should also be educated. We should also be supportive. We should also figure out ways to be kind and, and help the family and the loved ones um, uh, as they go through this very uh, hard process, difficult process, ultimately, um, the, when the, the loved one is no longer suffering, then everyone is in a way relieved, and yet um, it's still death and loss. Beautifully said. Thank you, Dr. Grube. Um, there have also been a series of questions around alternative routes of administration, be that through G2, rectally, all of those pieces, and just some questions about how that's managed, um, particularly if a person is, you know, for example, using a feeding tube but loses uh, capacity to utilize their hands or loses dexterity or whatever it might be. How how is it that a person is able to still administer the medication? Yeah, there's there are methods. I've never I've haven't had a patient to date. Maybe Dr. Grubez uh, has that you can do a gravity um, method of putting the liquid down into the G-tube. Um, have you had to do that, Dr. Gert? Well, I've uh, talked with doctors who have. I did not myself. No. Okay. But there is there is method to do that. So I think the, we remind ourselves about um, the fact that um, um, assisting um, an individual who's using uh, the, this uh, option uh, is legal in all jurisdictions. And so we can do all kinds of things to help them. If they can't lift their hands but can still suck, we can hold the uh, solution and they can suck out of the medicine uh, with their straw as long as they institute uh, the volitionally uh, the ingestion. Um, if it's, a, as uh, Dr. Jess said, if it's a, a stomach feeding tube, uh, a clip can be used that they could remove with their teeth or something for gravity to bring the medication in. Um, so. Each case, as we, as she so eloquently said, um, is so different that it has to be looked at individually um, and to be in, in creative ways. But uh, administration is by the patient. Um, we can assist in all other kinds of ways, but ultimately, uh, the patient themselves has to be the one to initiate uh, ingestion. Cheers. Um, a specific question on kind of the red flag side of things is, is there any pharmacy preparation considerations for post-bariatric surgery due to poor absorption? Um, I have not had to address that. We, uh, hmm. That's a good question. Well, that might be that might be a case. I mean, it's so individualized; it's difficult to speak to it. But that might be a case where rectal administration would be appropriate. Um, uh, cleaning out the uh, the colon with an enema, inserting the rectal uh, catheter uh, or Foley catheter, um, and then having the medicine be uh, injected by the patient that way to a, a to ensure um, absorption. Uh, if there's a question. Um, 
that's a that's a really great question, but quite uh, quite a specific one. And I did I had read about the rectal administration, and and I thought that has to be a very motivated patient because, you know, to position yourself to do your own uh, injection of the you know syringe. Um, I had read about that, and I thought I thought that myself. That that really would take some positioning. Yeah. Um, another question um, is around aid and dying medication used in healthcare facilities, licensed facilities, and um, how this has played out in your experience. Have you had uh, patients that you've worked with or counseled, for example, who live within an assisted living facility or in a intermediary care uh, facility, and how has this played out in those settings? Well, um, I have had those cases personally and, um, and, and observationally and in conversations with many other physicians. It really, again, uh, depends on a, a number of things. Uh, hopefully the institution itself will have a policy that is, allows for this. Mm -hmm. um, of course, um, it's almost never the hospital. Uh, it, that's the point of this. People want to die in their living situation. So if that's a, a assisted living uh, or extended care facility, um, generally, hopefully, the, host, the uh, facility will have, um, will give permission. Uh, I've had a couple of cases, and in one a personal case where um, we, we, the family took uh, their mother home for the uh, ingestion of the medication, have it done in her home rather than uh, in the assisted living, because the assisted living was not, uh, would not let, allow it to occur there. But the point was, uh, the woman who used the medication was with her family, her loved ones, her um, pet, and uh, her music. Uh, and so that was a, a gentle and beautiful uh, last uh, uh, moment in her life. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Grube. And then just one final question, uh, which was around you know, who is a qualified clinician to you know, write a prescription? And specifically, has there been any progress in terms of uh, advanced practice registered nurses or physician assistants uh, taking place in the medical aid and dying process? Well, I believe that uh, New Mexico's law, which was passed a couple weeks ago, includes advanced practice registered nurses as individuals who uh, could uh, provide this service. Um, there is no uh, specific, uh, specific uh, uh, certification, et cetera. Um, as a family physician who practiced all kinds of things, um, when I was first asked by a patient, um, I needed help. And so I went to the medical director of my hospice, who was an oncologist, and he uh, mentored me and, and, uh, and helped me. And then on, in the future, on other occasions, I would talk with him. But that's, in a way, the beauty of these laws is that it, by the fact that it requires two physicians, uh, there can be conversations about not only eligibility, but about how um, to, to manage best practices. And as we move along and we see hospices are more supportive, that's even a third arena and pharmacists and nurses uh, for support for uh, each of us as a clinician uh, to provide this uh, invaluable option uh, in cases for people who want it. Wonderful. Well, I just want to, I want to thank both of you um, for what you taught us today, but, uh, you know, probably most so the fact that while this was a, uh, a highly kind of clinical topic, um, that I felt like at the both, the center of both of your uh, presentations were the people that this represents, uh, the individuals who are uh, wanting this option, their families, uh, and those that are impacted, and the care that you take to make sure that they are indeed at the center of the process and that are uh, they're in the driver's seat and that you're supporting them in uh, having the end of life journey that that they would want and it's such a beautiful thing to hear that discussed in such a sensitive and caring way so thank you to both of you uh, for all that you said today and for answering those questions and with that i will turn it back over to crystal at city of hope to finish us out with announcements thank you please save the date for our end of life symposium, which will be held December 16th through 18th. We hope to see you in Las Vegas. We're happy to share another educational opportunity, which is now available through Medscape, 
on medical aid in dying, my clinical guide and practice points. Compassion and Choices has a plethora of free resources you can find on their website, including a free confidential consultation for doctors with other doctors who have practiced the full range of end of life options and can help mentor other doctors. Here are additional resources for you to reference. For more educational opportunities or to reference today's recording, please visit us at cityofhope.org forward slash CME. Thank you for participating in today's uh, series. We look forward to seeing you at the End of Life Symposium in Las Vegas.